Health and Only mode. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to one of our monthly webinars on marine protected areas uh, in collaboration with EBM Tools Network and Open Channels. So happy you're here. And today's subject is on external financing. So this is an opportunity to learn about some recent recommendations from the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee on a new report that they've put together called Protecting Our Marine Treasures, Sustainable Finance Options for U.S. Marine Protected Areas. And there's a lot of work that's been done on sustainable financing, but I think one of the things that's unique about this product is that it is really tailored to the United States and um, work that may be happening either here or in other countries that's particularly relevant to U.S. programs. Uh, but of course, it's also, I think, relevant to a lot of other programs elsewhere as well. So um, I'm going to introduce our speakers here in a moment, but I just wanted to remind you that we will go ahead and have a presentation from our two speakers, and then we will um, encourage you all to post your questions and comments, and I will moderate the discussion, but we definitely want to hear from you, so please go ahead and use the question box in the webinar interface to ask any questions or, or make any comments that you want. So i um, really pleased to have with us today uh, the chair and vice chair of the uh, external financing working group of the Marine Protected Areas FAC. Um, Brian Baird is the director of the Coast and Ocean Program at the Bay Institute and the Aquarium of the Bay in San Francisco. And his mission is to protect, restore, and inspire conservation of San Francisco Bay and its watershed from the Sierra to the sea. And in April 2016, he hosted the Action Summit, Golden State Waters, San Francisco Bay and the World's Ocean, which set a strong action agenda to help implement MPAs in California. Uh, and he is the co-chair of the Golden Gate Marine Protected Area Collaborative and was recently elected to serve as vice president of the Coastal State Stewardship Foundation. Before that, he previously served 18 years as the Assistant Secretary for Ocean and Coastal Policy under California Governors Brown, Schwarzenegger, Davis, and Wilson. And nationally, he served as the Chair of the Coastal States Organization and was also appointed as a State Government Advisor to the National Ocean Council by the White House Council on Environmental Quality. And Martha Honey is also with us. Martha is the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Responsible Travel, CREST, which is headquartered in Washington, D.C. Over the last two decades, she has written and lectured widely on ecotourism, travelers' philanthropy, cruise and resort tourism, and certification issues. And her books include Ecotourism and Sustainable Development, Who Owns Paradise? She is currently editing four volumes on climate change and coastal and marine tourism in the Caribbean to be published in 2017. And she also worked for 20 years as a journalist based in East Africa and Central America. So welcome both Brian and Martha, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Lauren. Uh, this is Brian Baird, and uh, I want to thank uh, everyone who is participating in this uh, webinar today. Um, I'd also like to start by thanking our subcommittee members, the people who put this, this report together. Just want to uh, let you all know that uh, we are all volunteers. I think we're knowledgeable volunteers, but uh, nonetheless we are volunteers on this committee. But I just want the uh, people who are listening to know that our committee members are people who are passionate about ocean protection and marine protected areas, and we are dedicated to making them work. Uh, none of this would have happened without a dedicated staff, and I just want to start out by thanking first Joanne Flanders, who seems to thrive on doing two jobs at once, which was helpful to me uh, and, and, the, and the committee. Also to Charlie Wally, who I've known for years, has been very helpful, and of course uh, Lauren Wenzel, our, uh, our fearless leader on this enterprise. Uh, at my organization, I want to thank Veronica Steinheimer, who has helped this committee every step of the way and helped me personally uh, quite a bit in making things happen. So on this report, uh, I, I don't know if we planned it th this way, but this report's pretty timely. We have a new administration, and the signals being transmitted indicate at a minimum significant fiscal restraint. I'll just, I'll just put it that way. So now more than ever, we need to stay focused on the objectives of protecting our nation's uh, marine resources. The fact is, once these resources are lost, they are lost. They are lost or gone forever. I hope that our report is going to assist you in seeking and obtaining funding necessary to protect 
what we call in this report our national marine treasures because uh, we we need to find the ways to make this uh, uh, all this continue and to make all this happen. And to the funders on the call, yes, I know you're out there, funders. Help us find the, the path to partnering with you to make these uh, objectives happen, to achieve these objectives. We, we desperately need your partnership and we desperately need your help. I'm going to turn it over to Martha, uh, honey, for just a, a few uh, opening remarks as well. Thank you, Brian. And I would just second everything that you say. Sitting here in Washington, we're totally aware of uh, tremendous changes coming and the need for looking for alternative finance. And I think that one of the things that we learned in doing this report is that there are a lot of possibilities out there for um, sources of potential private um, and other sources of funding other than the government grants for the MPAs. Uh, my particular expertise is in the tourism and the international partnerships area. So Brian is really going to carry the the, um, the water for this presentation and do the the um, the main bulk of of the uh, explaining what we what we found. And I just want to thank Brian for all of the work he put into it. We would not have this report and we wouldn't have it in this. Um, fine fashion if it weren't for, for the many, many hours and expertise that he contributed. So Brian, take it away. Thank you, Martha. That's great. Well, going to our, our first slide, um, basically we established early on in the report that marine protected areas require funding for all aspects from, from the designation, initial designation, uh, and what, all that goes into those designations to the final implementation. Uh, and, and view this report as a as a primer for ex, expanding uh, the use of external financing for, for marine protected areas. As I said, we're volunteers. We, we put a lot of time and effort into this. I think we've identified the key issues, but there's certainly more that, that can be learned. Um, this report uh, addresses issues at the national level and then for specific MPA programs throughout the uh, country and the MPA center. And it's basically attempting to find a wide range of approaches uh, to obtain external funding. Just to define external funding, it's uh, or financing, it's to describe any kind of, of funding, including in the definition in-kind uh, non-cash resources that an organization may receive. Um, although in-kind is part of the definition, uh, we did not really do a comprehensive view of the in-kind resources, although they are noted from time to time. A really important part uh, of this report and something that the committee members urged me to emphasize is that external financing is not intended to replace the need for dedicated government funding. Um, this is intended to uh, uh, amplify what uh, is there, should be there. <clears throat> so now moving to findings and recommendations. Uh, uh, some of this may seem obvious, but it needs to be stated so that we have a, a full view of, of everything that's happening. So these marine protected areas do require external uh, funding. The appropriated funds are rarely sufficient. That's one. Uh, and uh, it's challenging also for government agencies to receive external funding. It's a cumbersome process. There are lots of, of hoops that, that we have to go through. That's been a problem. There's a need for a comprehensive assessment of funding for U.S. marine protected areas. We really don't know, uh, don't have a, a road map for how all these areas have uh, been funded. Uh, we found that external funding sources uh, do exist, uh, but uh, some of them are underutilized or, or we, we haven't really pushed in some of those areas, and we'll talk about that. Um, external funders uh, want tangible results. They are, they're, oftentimes they're not interested in coming into a, a program and funding that extra staff person. They want to come in and fund the, the uh, enforcement program and that new doodad that you're going to use for enforcement, I think. Uh, there is a need for technical assistance and comprehensive uh, database to support these programs on external financing, and we uh, talk about that in our recommendations. And there's also the need for a national uh, ocean trust fund. So moving to our, our recommendations, uh, of course, the first one on the top is to enact a national ocean trust fund to help support these areas. This is nothing new. Uh, we had two bipartisan commissions, national commissions in this country, the U.S. Uh, Ocean Commission and the uh, Pew Ocean Commissions. 
both of whom made the strong recommendation to have this overall ocean trust fund. Uh, it was also su supported by the uh, Coastal States Organization, which I used to chair, and uh, that's an organization of th all 35 coastal states, territories, and commonwealths. So this is this is it, this isn't something that we just threw in lightly. This has got a lot of background. Uh, there was recent legislation by Senator Whitehouse on this. Uh, Prior to that, Congressman Farr had uh, legislation. Uh, now a new organization called the Joint Ocean Commission Initiative, which is made up of former members of the two national commissions, have also supported this. So that's our, our broad uh, uh, overview uh, recommendation. But going to more of the specifics of this, this report, uh, we do think we need uh, legislation or administrative processes, uh, some measures put in to allow greater flexibility for government entities to solicit and receive uh, external funding. Again, right now it's, it's, uh, it can be legally difficult and it can be cumbersome um, and uh, there are some reasons for, for, for some of the hoops that we have to jump through to be sure that ethics rules and so forth are, are covered, but we do think there's room for some streamlining there. Um, the next one is building on the pr uh, procedures by the Department of Interior's century-long support of national parks to implement new funding mechanisms. Well, we say centuries long. I think, I think it's like 165 uh, years of experience, actually, which uh, uh, they've been doing this 104 years before I was born. So they, they, uh, they know a little bit about this. And so uh, we, we, got a, we put in some examples uh, from Interior, but we think that there are more that we can mine. Uh, the next point is to develop new funding partnerships with the private sector. Uh, uh, who either benefit from marine protected areas or, or quite frankly, would benefit from association with uh, doing something wonderful for the environment. Uh, and there are already some examples uh, of this, but in the travel and tourism industry, automotive and insurance industries. Uh, uh, we really feel that the Department of Commerce, uh, in, in, in there are multiple roles of dealing with commerce in this nation, but also overseeing entities like uh, NOAA, uh, et cetera, that they could, could take the lead in engaging industry and NGOs, government, uh, et cetera, to, to move that forward. Moving to the Marine Protected Area Center, uh, two recommendations there that follow our findings, uh, that they should develop an external funding and partnership assistance capability within the MPA Center. Um, and I think it would be so helpful for us to be able to go to the center and get some ideas from them about opportunities and, and, and about how to go about this and possibly even some uh, direct assistance. Uh, we also call for a, a comprehensive survey of funding pra practices at existing uh, MPAs, the practices, the sources of funds, and the needs that were expressed. All of this would be helpful to people when they're looking for, for money. Now this is recommendations for this overall MPA programs. Uh, the first one is basically, hey managers, uh, take a look at this report and use it. And we, we hope that the material that we have put in this report helps you. Uh, and uh, certainly Martha and I remain available to uh, uh, you know, answer questions or whatever for those of you who, who, uh, who are you know, looking at the report and they want to learn more. Uh, uh, then an engagement with external uh, partners. We think that there really ought to be a strong priority uh, with that. Uh, th these sites need to make themselves visible. Uh, uh, we here at the uh, Aquarium of the Bay, we have a film and lecture program. We take people on tours. We do beach cleanups. All of these things uh, are, are good for the envir environment, but they also they give us great visibility um, with uh, funders. And then finally, uh, there's another one that the, 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 uh, the committee was, thought was very important, is that managers should pay careful attention to the limits of their authorities, procedures, and ethics rules to ensure that uh, whatever is done is done properly uh, and accountability. So, uh, accountably. So this is really uh, keeping it legal. So uh, we wanted to put that in there just to be sure that, uh, that uh, things are done properly. Okay, what I'm going to do now is run through uh, the three chapters of the report. Uh, those chapters are elements of success, which you see here, um, which talk about how uh, we go about um, the kinds of recommendations for looking for funding. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about funding vehicles. That's kind of the how you do this kind of like how, 
how can these funds be assembled and, and, and dispersed? There's a couple of categories of that. Um, and then finally, uh, uh, kind of an overview of sources of funding. So going through this first part, uh, uh, and again, some of this seems obvious, but I think you want to keep these, these ideas uh, in your head when you're preparing proposals and seeking support. First is to state clearly why this funding is necessary. Is there a compelling need and, and, and are there management goals, sound management goals that this uh, funding would support? Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, you do better when you go to a funder with innovation, with a new thing. Their money is going to, at the end of this grant, they're going to come back. You're going to be able to tell them that you made X, Y, and Z happen through uh, innovative approaches. That's important. Uh, when you look at the literature on this, on the next point, a business plan, uh, business plans are really thought to be important. Uh, the Department of the Interior is really uh, big on this. And you know, basically, you're making a formal, formal statement of business goals reasons they're attainable, and plans to achieve them. Uh, and just making it very, very accountable about uh, what you want to do, how you're going to do it, and, and, and et cetera, taking it to the end. Uh, demonstrating capacity to receive these funds, critical. Again, we talked about making your program visible. Um, enlisting partnerships and, su and supporters. Uh, there's no substitute for going in with a proposal with partners uh, who are doing similar things because in environmental management we tend to have a, a lot of people kind of doing the same thing and it makes a lot more sense for them to, to join forces or and or if, if they if you're the unique individual that should receive these funds that hopefully you, you gain the support of the community uh, and don't forget elected officials supporting what you're, you're proposing. Uh, and then finally uh, is identifying uh, funding sources. Uh, this is uh, in our chapter three, but there's a comprehensive overview of the sources of funding uh, that we are recommending that you look at. Funding vehicles, uh, we call this the how, or uh, the, the, the how you're going to um, yeah, uh, transfer funds and so forth. Uh, and we just sort of put this in, in uh, in, in, in general groupings, they're friends groups. We talk about, give a couple of examples, but they're friends groups all over the country that help raise money and provide all sorts of services. Uh, there are foundations. We reference the uh, uh, National Parks uh, Foundation, uh, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, entities like the Resources Legacy Fund Foundation, uh, et cetera, who, who provide uh, important services. There are fis fiscal sponsors that provide kind of an enhanced role in making these events happen, and other nonprofits, which are sort of hybrids of all of the above. Now, uh, chapter three, this is, this is uh, where we spent the majority of our time looking at, well, what are the sources? And uh, uh, I'm going to do a slide on each one of these, but here you can at least see it all in one place. Philanthropy, bond funding, uh, mitigation uh, from projects, uh, penalties and settlements, taxes, fees, corporate support, competitive government grants and funding, tourism-based support, and international partnerships. Just, just wanted to see it all in one place. <clears throat> then we, we move to the first one, philanthropy, which is probably one of the first places people tend to go. Uh, you've got the foundations, which we've mentioned. We've got congressionally chartered or authorized foundations uh, like NIFWF and the National Parks Foundation. We talked about friends groups. Um, corporate philanthropy, this is one that we really hope uh, can, can be increased. Uh, great examples are, are Pacific Life and, and uh, you know, their uh, corporate symbol is a humpback whale, and they do give fun funding to uh, whale research and, and other topics like that. Uh, another great one is Subaru uh, with their, their work uh, with the National Park Service on their national campaigns. Um, ind individual giving, I mean, if, if you know that, that person who's <laughs> at the large estate nearby who may want to uh, provide some, some special funding, I mean, uh, you know, we're constantly uh, working uh, with uh, some uh, wonderful people, wonderful individuals who have uh, provided funding for our sites. Uh, crowdsourcing we put in. Uh, crowdsourcing, I think, is probably a, a more commonly used tool for smaller uh, grant funding uh, processes, but there are certainly examples of, of some big ones. And we talk about Kickstarter, Crowdfunder, and uh, we actually cite a, uh, a, a process in Morrill Bay 
uh, where they use this the process to much to their advantage. Business revenue uh, sharing, things like 1% for the planet, and then special event funding. Uh, you know, and, any of you will be familiar with things like the climate ride. There are opportunities to do these these sorts of uh, fundraisers. And, and, and one thing I want to be sure people note when they uh, look at the report is we have case studies which are, are intended to be two to three page summaries uh, kind of illustrating how many of these things work. Uh, we uh, have the California Marine Life Protected Area Network uh, referenced for the great combination of foundation money, of philanthropy, and uh, government money, and uh, particularly bond uh, sources. Okay, let's, uh, and by the way, the case studies, California Marine Life Protected Area Network, uh, Caribbean uh, Biodiversity Fund in Forever, Costa Rica. I think you'll learn something if you go check those out. Bond funds, uh, two general types of, of bonds, but general obligations are the ones that I think are Used primarily, again, this was a, a big factor with the California Marine Life Protection Act. Uh, the Florida Forever Act raised $300 million uh, through a park bond. Uh, San Francisco Parks Bond was $195 million. So there are opportunities with these bonds. Um, I think they have to be done artfully because often bonds are considered uh, more limited to bricks and mortar projects than supporting management. Mitigation. Uh, uh, this is interesting. So when people build projects, oftentimes the projects, either while they're being built or after they're constructed and they know the, the full impact of their operations, uh, need to, to mitigate for unavoidable uh, adverse impacts. And uh, a couple of examples that we have here in, in California, uh, the, most of the coastal uh, power plants are what are called once through cooling facilities that bring in tremendous amounts of water and they entrain and impinge a lot of marine life. They do kill a lot of marine life, um, as well as larval forms of life. Uh, and so there is a move to do closed systems uh, for those uh, facilities. Uh, so uh, what has happened is our State Water Resources Control Board has basically established a policy that they should go to the closed loop systems, but until they do, they would put money into a fund. And that fund is brand new. It's, it's, I don't know if any money has come through it yet, but it will be um, in the millions of dollars. And uh, the number one priority listed for expenditures is to support marine protected areas. So that's, a, that's an exciting prospect for us here in California. Uh, another California example is decommissioning of offshore oil and gas platforms. Uh, basically, oil and gas producers are required to take every single part of those platforms off the ocean floor at the end of uh, the life of the platform. But they have uh, put forth proposals to, um, uh, to basically just take half uh, of the platforms out, to go down to about 60 feet of water depth, and leave the rest in place as artificial reefs. Um, Legislation is passed here in the state of California where it, in areas where that makes sense, some places it makes sense, some places it absolutely makes no sense to do this. But if it does make sense, then there's a possibility of permitting that activity. Uh, but the, the, the important thing is the oil and gas company will, could, will probably save hundreds of millions of dollars by not taking all this material out. The legislation requires them to share those cost savings uh, with uh, the state of California. It'll probably go into a trust fund or whatever. That is likely to be a, a good source of funding for us when, when or if those platforms are retired. Uh, we also talked a little bit about blue uh, carbon offsets. Um, this is kind of emerging, but uh, we do have mangroves and seagrass areas and tidal marshes that are part, parts of uh, marine protected areas, and they can be used for carbon sequestration. And there are some processes right now uh, moving forward to make that happen. Uh, penalties and settlements, uh, certainly everyone's aware of the, the tragedy of oil spills throughout our, our country. We list a few here, uh, a couple in California, and uh, Deepwater Horizon and the Exxon uh, Valdez oil spill. And when those occur, there are uh, penalties, civil penalties, natural resource damage assessment uh, penalties. Uh, and uh, there's also another thing, uh, community service payments that um, can be provided specifically to congressionally chartered foundations. And oftentimes those are for criminal activities like high seas uh, pollution or plastics dumping, et cetera. So 
these are areas that everyone needs to keep their eye on because there is some potential for funding uh, from these, these settlements. Uh, taxes, the T word, um, there, there uh, have been uh, uh, t taxes passed, bond measures and other things, but, uh, but actually specific taxes to support um, environmental uh, causes and we put in uh, uh, some things here, none of which are specific to MPAs, but they, the concept still holds true with state parks in Minnesota and um, open space in Maryland. Um, the one that I'm most familiar with, and, and if you haven't felt a little bit of a California influence to this report, <laughs> you should because, it, you know, I'm a Californian and I know a little bit more about California stuff. And we, have, we tend to have a lot of examples here, but Measure AA in California, um, which was just voted in, which had to be um, approved uh, basically by the majority of nine Bay Area counties. And what it does, it provides a, a, about $20 million a year or $500 million over the life of the program for wetlands uh, restoration and land acquisition and, and things uh, like that. But, uh, but this was one where a campaign was put forth. There is a problem uh, uh, and a need for this, this restoration. It ties in quite nicely with uh, climate change because this restoration was affecting uh, um, uh, stability of shorelines and so forth. So these are things to be to be thinking about. And moving on to fees, um, lots of different types of fees, which basically are the, for the uh, privilege of use or access to areas. Uh, we've got lots of examples of special use permits, uh, fees for service, entrance access fees, and uh, concessions. Uh, we provide some examples from uh, the National Park Service uh, and then uh, some locational things in Hawaii and uh, the Dry Tortugas. Corporate support. Uh, we just sort of laid out the kind of ways that corporations can uh, be involved uh, with, uh, with marine protected areas or any environmental uh, cause. Um, you know, financial through media, in-kind support or corporate uh, social responsibility. Uh, again, the, the Subaru uh, Find Your Parks campaign is pretty hard to beat in terms of they're, they're kind of engaged in all of that because uh, they have put money in. They have done a lot of advertising. They supported the uh, film that Greg McGilvery made on our nas nation's parks. Uh, uh, I think they're kind of a poster child right now for that kind of support. Uh, Moving on to competitive government grants and funding. Um, I mean, this spans the gamut. It can be any one of many types of, 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 of grants and funding vehicles. We just noted a few, um, you know, if, if you're doing research in an MPA, National Sea Grant and State Sea Grant funds uh, uh, can be used. Um, here in California, we have specific grant funding programs that, that go to ocean issues. Coastal Impact Assistance Program, that's a, a program where uh, I think there used to be probably still are uh, seven states in this nation that have uh, offshore oil and gas development off their coasts and revenues are shared from that, uh, that production and those are put into environmental grant programs, which I used to run the one for the state of California. Um, National Parks, NOAA, there's some other ones that we sort of uh, just threw in here uh, as examples, but I think you get the idea. Um, so with that, we are moving on to uh, tourism and, and then uh, also following that international partnerships and this is uh, Martha Honey's area of expertise so I'm going to turn it over to Martha. Great, thank you so much Brian, that was an excellent summary of the uh, most of the report. So <laughs> on tourism, um, Tourism is the, the world's largest service industry, and it is also, as of course you all know, um, tourists use MPAs very heavily. And we, we felt in doing um, our research that there are really a lot of possibilities for um, additional external fundraising through tourism and tourism businesses and associations and activities. And that this is perhaps an underutilized, um, by many MPAs, an underutilized um, area of external fundraising. Um, and we pulled together some examples from the U.S., but also a few international examples. Uh, that we felt were relevant vis-a-vis -vis tourism. So one is, and some of this overlaps a bit with the, the earlier parts of the report that Brian has covered, but one is um, taxes, and taxes that are earmarked for conservation, including MPAs. 
and we, we put together a few examples. One of them is the Hawaii um, transient accommodation tax. And this is paid by owners of properties that are rented for short stays, that is less than 180 days. And in, in 2015, it raised $435 million, so it's a significant amount of money, and a significant percentage of this was earmarked for natural resources management, including MPAs in Hawaii. So this is something that other, other states could perhaps look, you could look for in, in other states. And then uh, sort of at the other end of the spectrum, because it tends to be smaller scale um, contributions, but it's what we call traveler's philanthropy. And this is tourism businesses and travelers or visitors donating to both community and conservation projects in the destinations that they visit. And just a couple of examples of some of this, this is a, a, from the work that, that I'm doing, is an exponentially growing source of funding that is flowing from tourism into conservation and community projects, including MPAs. For instance, one, um, one project, Brian referenced this earlier, um, is the 1% uh, for the planet. The company Oars, which is an adventure tourism um, company, is part of this program. And they have been donating specifically to the National Parks Foundation, not to MPAs, but to the, the land-based parks. But it, it, it's a very important model that it seems to us could very easily be adapted to, um, to MPAs. And then another project which um, I've been intimately involved in is called Care for the Cape and um, Islands in Massachusetts. And this is um, a, what we call a destination-wide traveler's philanthropy project. It's the first one in the US. And um, Oregon now has a, has a project as well similar to this. And basically, it's uh, community fundraising from tourism and other businesses and associations, as well as from homeowners and vacationers for environmental projects in Cape Cod. And these tend to be small grants uh, that are given out um, annually through a competitive process, an application process. And they've gone in Cape Cod for the Cape Cod um, National Seashore and uh, for some um, uh, marine research um, reserve work. So uh, these are just a few. There are many more in the re there are a number more in the report um, of sources of funding. From, um, from both taxes, travelers, philanthropy, and other sources of tourism. We looked for each of this, the segments of um, uh, uh, different types of fundraising. We looked at both the pros and cons. And for tourism specifically, um, some of the pros are that, as I mentioned, surveys um, show that travelers who enjoy a destination say that they want to give back. And so this is really a, a source of, if it's well organized, a source of oftentimes untapped giving that can be collected in the donations for specific projects, including marine protected areas. Um, and earmarked taxes um, raise considerable amounts of money. And if, it, if you can get some of that money flowing to MPAs, this is a steady, um, a legislated um, source of funding that um, can, can really provide some substantial funds. Uh, some of the cons for tourism. Um, Fundraising are that tourism is unpredictable and goes up and down with the economy and politics and so on. So it's not always um, something to be banked on. And also, not all MPAs are suitable for tourism. So you really have to assess, is your MPA already being used for tourism, or is it, does it have potential? And therefore, can these, these sources be tapped? Moving on then to the next slide, which is on international partnerships. Can we change the slide? Hello? It's changed now, Martha. OK, thank you. Okay. Were you able to hear me before? Yes, yeah, we can hear you. Oh, good, great, good. Um, Sorry, okay, so. <laughs> But it has changed now, yes. So the final uh, uh, segment that we looked at is international partnerships. And we, we sort of brought this in at the end um, partly for, for two main reasons. One is that we think from conferences that a number of us have been to and so on, that there are a lot of ideas and models out there that are being done in other countries that could be replicated by US MPAs. And um, a second 
part of international partnerships is that it is also possible for US MBAs to partner with MPAs in other countries where there are shared um, areas of conservation and to do joint projects and joint work with other MPAs and through that tap into some sources of, of, of funding that would not be that would not be open to US MPAs if they went in alone. So oftentimes these sources of funding are from international conservation organizations and the international finance institutions like the World Bank or the GEF or um, Inter-American Development Fund, et cetera. And um, therefore it requires that the main recipient be um, the developing countries and MPAs in developing countries. But that uh, US MPAs may qualify for funding, um, may not qualify for funding, but they can certainly benefit from funding by cooperating and working with international MPAs and um, having cooperative agreements for joint research, management, um, exchange of personnel, and so on. One example that we looked at, we have as a case study, is the um, Caribbean Biodiversity Fund. And this is a regional endowment fund uh, that contributes uh, to contribute sustainability and uh, substantial sources of money to grow and manage coastal resources and MPAs in the Caribbean. The initial commitment is for $42 million and it has been put forward forth by the uh, German Development Bank and the GEF, um, the World Bank and the UN Env Development Program being the main institutions behind that. And uh, the Nature Conservatory is the Conservancy is the managing institution organization for this fund. There are 10 participating countries um, so far, and others um, are, are likely to be joining in current coming years. And the requirement is to tap into this um, this. Uh, Caribbean Biodiversity Fund is that each of the participating countries need to set up their own National Protected Areas Trust Fund. And for every dollar that is raised locally, they can draw on one dollar from the CBF, the Caribbean Biodiversity Fund um, money, the central pool of money, and so therefore double the amount of money that they are um, are, are raising for coastal protection and marine protected areas. And the, the key is that they need to come up with new sources of funding. It can't simply be what they already have in their national budgets. And so there's a whole variety of different kinds of funding sources that are being developed and um, proposed as local matching funds. And this includes, uh, it can include things like the park entrance fees and permits, diving and fishing licenses, travelers philanthropy programs, corporate funding, debt for nature swaps, and so on. So looking at some of the pros and cons with these international partnerships, um, one thing that the TNC, that the Nature Conservancy, uh, Conservancy has found is that it takes a lot of time to create these national trust funds, in part because there may be political opposition to setting it up and legal challenges, and that there are just these are poor countries and there are lots of demands for resources. So the project is moving in, in, in some of the countries slower than had been slated, but it is moving forward. Um, and one of the positive things is that the CBF staff see, the, see that this, this project is very applicable for both Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands, and they've expressed an interest in incorporating MPAs, particularly in these um, parts of the US. So that is it for the international partnerships and the tourism sector, and I'll turn it back to Brian. Martha, great job. Thank you for doing that. Really You're appreciate welcome. it. Let's see here. Well, really, this, this um, wraps up our presentation. Uh, th these are all our, our members. Uh, you've heard from Martha. We also had Dr. Ryan Orgera, uh, Jason Patlas, Kathy Reheis boyd Pete Stauffer, Tricia Watson, and Cliff McCready, all of which uh, we got to know well from uh, many, many, many uh, conference calls and uh, a few times uh, working together in, in person. Um, and uh, I think we're to the uh, question and uh, comments portion of the program. And my understanding is, Lauren, you, you, you run that, right? Yeah, I will go ahead and invite anyone who has any questions or comments, please go ahead and type them into the question bar there. And you can see that Brian has posted the link to the report. So I encourage you to go to the MPA Center website. Uh, he's got the shortened URL here. It's a little easier to follow. Uh, but that report is posted there. And we will also post this webinar online. 
as well on uh, on open channels. So if anyone wants to go back and and listen or you missed part of it, it will be posted. So um, Brian and Martha, you're we're going to give you a uh, curveball right off the bat because the first question that has come in is. Uh, <clears throat> It's a little bit outside the scope of the report, but I will pass it on to you. It says, uh, this is from Richard Charter, can you please address briefly the new need to garner new kinds of fiscal support for defending MPAs that are under attack by various special interests? Mm -hmm. And goes on to talk about um, uh, enlisting uh, su support to kill, preserve uh, areas in Biscayne National Park. Um, and just concerned that there may be um, efforts to undermine existing MPAs and how can we support existing MPAs and, and enlist support from prospective funders in that role. Well, let me go ahead. No, I, and take, go uh, ahead. You go. Take well, it I'll take, And then uh, you go next. Uh, it, uh, I, I, I think the bottom line here is all of this um, should be science-driven and, and uh, results driven. And uh, I, I personally believe the best um, uh, way, to, way to deal with this is to basically be saying, hey, look, here, here in California, for example, uh, we've had uh, M MPAs off the Channel Islands for many years, and we've done a series of, of major reviews of the performance of those MPAs. And something magic has happened there. There's a lot more fish. And, uh, and something else has happened there. I think that the predictions of, of severe uh, economic impacts and, and uh, uh, problems with, you know, if, if you would go to some of these um, uh, boat shows and so forth, at, at times you, you got the impression that the entire Channel Islands were closed to the public, which just was not true. So I, I personally believe leading with facts leading with science, leading with the economic data uh, from these areas that, that just irrefutably proves how, how well they work uh, and how they are actually, uh, I, I think, beneficial to the economy as opposed to being something that is um, uh, problematic for the economy. So, so in response to your question, I think I think you, you look at the world and look at the, at the way things are happening, and 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 uh, I think when you put these these areas in, almost always we see a, a, a pretty positive result. But Martha, I think that that's that's a great start. I mean, that's certainly one of the one of the legs that needs to be put down is the the scientific case for MPAs including as, as important in climate change and reducing the impacts of climate change and so on, and all the, the reasons that you mentioned. In addition to that, I think, and this is really sort of a, one of the hearts of our report, that it's not just about local fundraising, but local fundraising is also, or fundraising is also a vehicle for building local alliances and building local support. And I think we need, you know, on the one hand, the scientific evidence and support for the, the case for why MPAs are vital. But on the other hand, we need those alliances. And so external funding can be a way of really engaging with the community, building friends of groups, building alliances with uh, local businesses and associations and so on, and building that um, public backing for MPAs that is the other important piece to go along with the scientific rationale for MPAs. And just to add one additional little thing, which is sort of in your area actually, but um, uh, you know, the, the biggest economic generator of the ocean dependent industries on the California coast is, is recreation and tourism. And when, when we are able to, to basically say things like, you know, the Channel Islands are almost like the Galapagos of the Pacific here, you know, I mean, they're like this amazing area, and, it, it, and they really are. And, and part of the reason they are is because we've taken measures to, to protect them. So I, I do think that investment in environmental protection and stewardship is, is, is just an absolutely uh, a, a clear economic investment for this country. So you guys have certainly got the conversation started. There's all kinds of questions now, uh -oh. which is good. Um, so one is uh, from your colleague, Jason Patlas, who says, thanks for the great work. While this is really directed toward a US audience for US MPAs, can you discuss the applicability for a more international audience? 
Yes. Well, you know, really what we looked at was sort of what are the lessons we can draw from around the world that could be applicable here. And, I, and as I indicated, I think there are many of those, but certainly some of the things, I mean, in terms of one, how MPAs are managed, et cetera, et cetera, I think there were lessons this report could easily be read by MPAs in other countries and utilized by them. And I, I you know, I really see it as um, uh, we, we need to be working much more and learning from and helping to inform international MPAs, in part because our MPAs bump into other MPAs in, you know, all around our coast. And we now have, for instance, um, a working relationship with MPAs in Cuba through NOAA, which is wonderful. And hopefully a lot of collaboration will come and learning, and certainly Cuba can definitely learn from some of the lessons of um, from from our MPAs in terms of financing and sources of financing and so on. But I, I do feel that sort of, uh, for me at least, a couple of the takeaways from our research and this report are that MPAs in the U.S. are really behind both um, the National Parks Foundation and the National Parks in terms of tapping into external sources of funding. Brian gave the case of Subaru and so on in the national parks. And I think that, that in general, there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from the national parks, from the, from the terrestrial parks in our countries, and also from international MPAs and funding sources. Great. So here's another question about ecotourism. Can you, this is from Nicole Bransom. Can you share any details you know about the partnership between Lind Ladd Expeditions and National Geographic? Uh, what MPAs benefit from this support? And do tourists pay this 1% fee? And is it voluntary? Yeah. So what Lind Ladd does is they, they, they don't do the 1%. That's, that's ORS, and I'm sure that there are many other companies doing it. Lindblad has its own program, which is now merged since they've merged several years ago with National Geographic. And it's really one of the most developed programs. It's, it started in particular in the Galapagos, so it's going in part to protect the marine protected area around the Galapagos, and it's also going to support some land-based projects there. But what they do is they, they have small boats and they take people around the Galapagos and then towards the end of the trip and they're meeting with scientists and so on and learning about a lot of the threats to the Galapagos and towards the end of the trip they um, give a letter to all the people, put it in their cabins um, on the trip, asking if they would consider making a donation to the Galapagos Fund that Lindblad and Lindblad National Geographic administer or are raising funds for that goes to support a number of local projects and they list the projects that it goes to support. And what they offer, which I think is just really smart, is that for a donation of $250, they will give um, passengers, their guests, a voucher worth 250 for another trip anywhere in the world with Lindblad. So it basically, as and I've interviewed some of their passengers and so on because it's such an exceptional program, they've raised millions of dollars for the Galapagos through this. And it also is a good marketing tool. It guarantees that this particular passenger, and probably will bring others, family members and friends and so on, will go on other Lindblad expeditions. And for the, the some of the people I've interviewed, they say, this is a no-brainer. This is great. We're going to go with Lindblad again anyway. So this is simply paying forward towards another trip. And that $250 goes to the Galapagos Fund. Lindblad has set this up in Alaska, in Baja, California, probably other des Costa Rica, um, and they're just moving into Cuba. So um, they basically have this in the in the areas where they do small boat tourism, uh, small ship tourism. That's great. great. Thanks, Martha. Um, so another question from David McGuire, who is the shark with the Shark Stewards, uh, asks, "What's the best way to generate public interest and support for protecting offshore or remote MPAs that the public cannot experience, or at least not readily, like the Farallon Islands and Papahana Mukuakea?" Oh, this is Brian. Um, I, I'll just make a few comments. Martha probably has some as well. But you know, uh, for those of you who don't know David, David is head of uh, Shark Stewards organization and is also my co-chair on the Golden Gate Marine Protected Area Collaborative. And I think what has been really helpful, some of the work, uh, for example, that uh, you do, David, with 
um, the lecture programs and, and taking kids out on vessels to actually see these areas and, and making videos and, and, and photography that uh, we show. And I, I've had a lecture program. I've done 53 lectures uh, here at the aquarium, many of which focus on on the, these MPAs, and I, I think the the fact of the matter is that um, th those waters are they're spectacular, uh, they're they're mysterious, they're just absolutely uh, you know fantastic, but they're also kind of remote. Um, and so here uh, off of uh, San Francisco, we've got the Farallon Islands. We've got a, what appears to be a very very remote area of these islands right next next to one of the largest urban areas in, in the country. Um, so I think uh, what we're, we've been really trying to do is is bring people in, uh, you know, exploration people, people who do marine archaeology, people who do um, uh, the monitoring and research out there. And get them in to give presentations to show the public what's out there, because most of the public will will never probably see some of these areas. Martha, I don't know if you. Yeah, have I think that's no. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, the one other thing that I would add is that sometimes maybe an avenue into some of these remote MPAs is through the you know the habitat that lives there, sharks, whales, whatever, and getting people to educating people to really care about the protection of particular species, and then. Um, you know, promoting that the, the species are in such and such MPAs and so on, and and trying to raise money through through the species for the MPAs. But I think public education and videos. I mean, we've just seen an explosion of of wildlife videos, which are really really important for um, you know for for raising awareness and so on. And especially as we move away from in terms of you know responsible tourism and responsible practices from having many of these species captive, you know, dolphins and so on, or, or in, used for, you know, swimming with the, the dolphins and so on. Some of these things many of us feel are, are practices that should not be practiced. And so we really need these videos, we need these lectures, we need some way to be educating the public because they're not going to be able to, you know, hopefully go to SeaWorld and see some of these, hopefully some of these practices will be phased out. And so we do need new tools and video and lectures are, are important um, tools for that as we reduce the, the captive population. And just to add one thing, a little plug, um, we have the San Francisco International Ocean Film Festival coming up. Um, mm -hmm. It really is fantastic and, and uh, for locally for showing all sorts of things regarding the ocean in, in our area, but it's an international uh, uh, event, so they've got uh, films about what's happening with these areas all throughout the world, and uh, people really flock to this event, and, and uh, uh, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that I think really makes a difference. Great. Uh, here's a question from James Barmarek. Uh, to what extent can state fish and game and park agencies that are much more financially self-sufficient than federal resource agencies lead the way to more sustainable finance for marine protected areas? So, uh, Brian, I don't know if you would agree with that premise. I'm kind of interested in your response. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know whether I would either, actually. I mean, I, I think... I, 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 the, the fish and game folks that I'm, I'm aware of and the, the kind of enforcement uh, programs and things uh, that we have, I, I, I think they're certainly improving. Money is beginning to come into those organizations, but um, I don't know that I would hold up the California Department of Fish and Game as the example of being overfunded. <laughs> uh, and I, I think, quite frankly, they're usually pretty underfunded. Um, uh, I, but I will say this: that the funding that that they do receive uh, to, to do these um, these events, uh, 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 one reason that 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 happens is our leadership in this in this state. Um, uh, really, I think when when uh, the ML Marine Lake Protection Act got going in in California, it really started moving with Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, who was just an absolute supporter of this process. And he went out in the shore, shores of Point Lobos uh, Marine Reserve, and he released the Ocean Action Plan that I, I wrote for him. And and uh, then along comes uh, uh, Governor Brown, who is just an absolute supporter of of this this work, and we have a, a legislature who's, who's, who's pretty supportive. Um, uh, I would say, as we, we kind of mentioned a little bit in the beginning, the, the national picture is not looking that strong right now with regard to our issues, uh, either in Congress or with the administration. And so um, I, 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 I guess I'd have to say best of luck, you know, I mean, really, it's, it's 
it's as, as I've done here in California over and over. The very first thing I did when I wrote to Governor uh, Wilson's Ocean Action uh, Plan was I, I did an economic assessment of ocean dependent industry, so I could show uh, both sides of the aisle that this stuff actually helps the economy, uh, and and I, I I think that's what we all have to to keep doing and saying and using real data and information to prove that point. Uh, because it's, it, I believe it's a, it's a struggle at, at uh, both the national and the, the state level. Although, I, again, I think we are blessed here in California with a, a governor, a legislature who are pretty supportive of us. And I would just add one thing I learned from this report is how much uh, diversity of, of approaches there are in the various states. And I think that is one benefit that we have in our in our system, we, we tend to encourage experimentation at the state level so that you can see what kinds of innovative approaches are bubbling up. And this report, I think, does a good job of capturing a lot of those. But I think, so, you know, I, I think one of the things we all felt was that we also undoubtedly are missing a lot of what's going on. And so I think as we move into an era where probably national funding is going to be much tighter, you know, the, the good models that are coming from California and other states really need to be elevated so that others can, can learn from them. And uh, this is just sort of a, a, another plug for we need a central da database, you know, with the MPA Center or someplace that is, is capturing all, uh, all of what's going on out there um, with fundraising for MPAs or other examples that could be used by MPAs. Yeah, great point. So here are two related questions, um, and they have to do with payments for ecosystem services. So from Gwen Griffith, she asks, have there been any attempts to do valuation studies for ecosystem services from MPAs and attempts at payments for ecosystem services as a funding source? And then Carol Bernthal also asked specifically about blue carbon and how that might work. Can either of you talk just a little bit about the idea of, of capturing payments for ecosystem services? Oh, you know, it's cool. not, yeah, it's not something that I know very, I, I, I don't know living examples very well. Maybe some of the, the, the listeners uh, who are participating in this do know. I, I know with the blue carbon, this is just getting off the ground, and there are a couple of organizations that are endeavoring to set up systems for capturing funds around carbon sinks that are in the oceans, as Brian said, for uh, particularly for mangroves and um, seagrasses, uh, and it's a, it's a new area. The the payment for environmental services. There are a lot of organizations working on this. I it's just not an area that I'm really familiar with in terms of how it's been operationalized to raise money. Yeah, and I I to be honest with you, I do believe we do have assessments of this sort of thing, but I I just have not been in the thick of that for a while. <laughs> Well, so it sounds I, I like it might be a good so. topic for a future webinar. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Yes. That would be an excellent yes. topic. Yep. Um, so, uh, Martha, you may want to comment on this. The report mentioned debt for nature swaps and that they haven't really been used in the U.S. Have you identified any potential opportunities where debt for nature could be used in the United States? Yeah, I think this needs to be looked at. I mean, it's being used for MPAs in, for instance, in Grenada, in... Um, say Pilau, um, and uh, it, and it's it's in, in in the process of being um, set up in Grenada now, and um, and so on. But you know, I don't I don't know, and it might might work for Puerto Rico or the or the Virgin Islands. I just don't know if the U.S. foreign debt <laughs> could be partially written off this way, and if you know the the um, the countries alone, the lenders who we owe our debt to, would be interested. I just, you know, I, I'm not sure, but I think it, it is something that um, should be looked at, particularly by some of our periphery, Hawaii and so on, um, perhaps. Um, I think it's a little tricky. Where, where it might be more applicable is if we're sharing um, MPAs with with countries that have foreign debts, and it could be looked at there. But I think it's worth, you know, again, it's it's something that I think we raise, and and again, it needs some more research to see what are the limitations, what are the possibilities of using it in the U.S. Um, certainly, the U.S. has a huge foreign debt, and um, whether there could be some kind of debt for nature swap with our MPAs um, 
you know, I think it, it, it needs to have some investigation. Maybe the research has been done on this. It's not something that I am aware of if it has been. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we need to wrap up here. I will just say there's been a question here that says, is there a freeze on all federal grant funding, such as NOAA, EPA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? Not to my knowledge. There may be some selected programs that have been halted, but uh, not to my knowledge, there's not a freeze on federal grants. So just in, in response to that so question. So just for the, but the EPA there is, is that right, Lauren? Uh, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure what the restrictions are at the EPA. There have been some, there have been some restrictions, but I, I wouldn't want to speak to exactly what they are. Um, so maybe we can get back to you all on that. But, but I will just say it's not blanket. So I would, if you are interested in specific grants, I would look into the particulars and, uh, and check on those. I know, for example, there are, NOAA has some coastal resilience grants that are open right now people can can put in proposals for. Uh, so I just wanted to thank our speakers. I, I wanted to note some other thanks from some of the audience members who really thank the speakers and also the committee for this report and, and how useful they will find it. Um, and, and it will, the, as I mentioned, the report is posted on the MPA Center webpage and you have the shortened URL right here on the slide. I encourage you to, to go investigate and we'll also be posting this webinar on open channels and the PowerPoint on the MPA Center page. So again, thanks to our speakers and to open channels and EBM tools. All right. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye.